first is um, on the naming of the documents, please, I, I don't know most of you have used the, the naming I've asked for. The reason why I asked for that is because I get something that looks like this. Like I've got about 150 documents all shared with me. So for me to work through all that with TAs and, and create the subject, it really helps if you use that with the naming scheme I've asked for. The second thing is I asked and stressed not to use a Word document or PDFs or Excel files as handed. Um, let me just explain the thinking for that so that you can see, see why, why we're asking for If you hand in a PDF, I get something that looks like this on my side, which is great. It's, it looks like a, Word, a PDF document. Um, but when we're grading electronically, what we tend to do is the following. Uh, we use the comment feature up here, and if it's a PDF, we cannot comment on particular areas. So if there was a mistake in question two, we wanted to comment on, on something over there. At best, when we click comment, we can write a comment, but it's, it's for the whole document. So, um, yeah, sure, the TA or myself, we can write question two, page three, and then describe the issue. Um, so that, that's, that's hard for us to do. If you submit a Word document, a uh, similar idea, um, so here's a group's Word document. We can't comment on it again other than just clicking comments there, and there so Alicia has written uh, some, some great information. Um, but again, it applies to the whole document itself. If you submit a native Google document, uh, the tiers myself can be a bit more effective with the commenting. What we can do then is we can select right where the error is. So for example, here if, if you should have used 7% instead of 5%, I can highlight that and then go insert comment right over there and it highlights it uh, for you where exactly your error occurred. And that's, that's what the TAs and myself want to do. So we're going to emphasize that we must submit the Google document, not the Word document that you then imported or just shared through Google Drive. And from the next assignment, from the next assignment that is mandatory. Uh, the reason why we're, why we're requiring that is because the final report needs to be in that in that format as well, the, the large SEL report. So these assignments are for, a way for you to iron out the bugs with tables, an equation editor. Uh, Google Docs has all those features. Um, so you can insert tables, you can, uh, so there's a table feature, there's insert drawings, equations, hyperlinks, and images uh, can be added over there. So we, we are going to require that from the next assignment onwards. If you feel that from your group submission for assignment three, um, we're going to be marginally penalizing the fact that we don't get Google Docs. So if you feel that your group wants to submit assignment three again, you have until the end of tonight to resubmit assignment three. Okay. Because we are going to start to get pretty, pretty strenuous, and from assignment four, it's going to be uh, pretty much an all or nothing grade. Uh, and, and, and that's just for the grade. Question? Okay, so yeah. Sorry, just a second. Everyone? Yeah? If we hand the assignment three in hard copy, does that affect that? No, if you hand it in hard copy, it does not affect you. And the reason why, um, just coming back to uh, the handouts for Word documents and Excel documents, uh, one group tends to hand in not a single document, they're handing in a bunch of, uh, they're sharing a folder which contains an Excel file, a Word document, and a couple of them separately. Um, again, you wouldn't submit a report to your manager in multiple pages, unstable or uncollected. Right? Uh, so, so that's not a valid hand in. Nor is a spreadsheet by itself a valid hand in because a spreadsheet doesn't tell me anything. I don't see the assumptions. Uh, we're certainly not going to inspect the equations inside your, your spreadsheet. If you had handed in a printout of your spreadsheet, your manager has no way to check your formula. So why, I know from the electronic one, we obviously could go check your formula, but the volume of work that that is for the TA and myself is, 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 is unreasonable. So uh, if you're submitting spreadsheets um, as part of your submission, they should go inside the document in the question. So here's the question 
a description um, of the problem, the assumptions used, and then a spreadsheet or a table of numbers with the equations and, and all the necessary information in it. If you scroll further down, this group has done what we, what we want to do. Um, so there's the tables, there's figures in line, uh, the question, figures in line, the question, the figures in line. We don't want a whole collection of figures at the end, spreadsheets at the end. I, we can't read through that. It needs to be followed and flow linearly. So that's what we're, we're aiming for for assignment four and five and the future, and as well to be a final project. <coughs> Any any clarification <coughs> on that? Any any issues so far with criminal docs for those of you that are using it? Okay. The uh, I, I would like to see feedback, even if you don't get any feedback on criminal docs uh, here in the class, if you can. Finally, uh, the reason is we're, we're trying to modify the way we do assignments, hand ins. Um, certainly, myself, uh, I'm probably the only one in the chemistry department right now who's accepting electronic hand ins and grading. Um, but I can see it spreading to some of the other 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 parts as well. And some of the, I know other other faculties in the university already do this as a standard yeah, grade. This is like some that I was using Google Docs. I know we were kind of adverse to switching over to it at the beginning, but once we did, we realized that we can all be working on the same document simultaneously. You can have like, different people writing every question at the same time, and it doesn't mess up or anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that was one of the main drivers why I picked Google Docs uh, for this course is because, as Brandon said. You could be editing question one, and one of your colleagues could be editing question one. Google Docs is pretty smart at avoiding conflicts. So you can both be working on the document simultaneously. One person is Saga, another person Brampton, and it's, it handles it just fine, uh, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, but in case you weren't, that's one of the reasons why we like Google Docs. Um, I don't know, also when the TA is grading it, I don't know if you get an email back that says she or, or he has made a notification. Um, you can change the settings uh, so you can avoid having a, a mailbox for spam. Okay, so, so that's what we'd like to see from assignment four onwards. Um, and certainly if you have the opportunity to revise assignment three, I strongly encourage you. It just makes the TA a lot more difficult. So let's just uh, quickly recap uh, last week, Friday. Uh, we started to look at cost estimation. And uh, we gave this example of SIMCRUD as a justification for, for coming up with reasonable cost estimates. And then we, we saw that there's multiple levels of cost estimation, multiple levels of detail. At the crudest level, we have our flow sheets from, um, as you would have seen in the second year, where you design and, and size the various streams. Once that gets approved, we can go ahead and get a more more detailed design. We're starting to add some of the final elements like valves, exchanges here, compressors, and the actual units and the actions themselves. This level of detail would allow you to make a reasonable estimate of the capital cost required. This is the level we're going to focus on for, for this course. Somewhere between this level and this level over here, where we've got quite a bit of detail on, on, on the units. So here we even start to see feedback control loops, the loop exchanges, the loop donors over there. Um, we have all the flowing information, which isn't actually indicated on this particular screenshot. We've got the screen number and what the components are. Uh, normally we would have another few rows here that gives the molar flow rates and temperatures and pressures of those screens. This is the level of detail we have been looking for for the flow sheets in your SDL project. So let's be clear on that. Your final project will have feedback control loops, instrumentation, obviously the major units themselves, flow rates and, and temperatures and pressures of the streams. Is what we're looking at. So we're looking at a typical design for one of these parts. This level of complexity um, we will see later on in the course, but it's not required for your SDL budget. We will see this when we start to look at startup and shutdown and troubleshooting of the process. Uh, these, these, all this, this detail here on the different uh, control loops 
are going to be critical when we're looking at, at safety and instrumentation to handle safety issues around our process. And also, um, how does this instrumentation react when things go wrong? So there's a big component in the course on when things go wrong, and Dr. Mahan is going to be teaching that in the week of the time, um, and as well as myself. But uh, this, this understanding is required for, for that part of the course. But for capital cost estimation, uh, we're going to look at somewhere between an order of magnitude and, a, and the study estimate. Is, is, um, well, sorry, we're not even looking at order of magnitude. We're going to have to look at the study estimate. So we want estimates that are pretty much within 30% of our final, <coughs> final project. The definitive estimate, uh, this requires a, a kind of whole work. Uh, we won't get to that level of accuracy in this course. So last class, we covered this topic of um, the turnover ratio. And we saw this in the assignment yesterday, where we're simply saying a very crude estimate of your capital costs is simply equal to the total sales, gross annual sales. Because that ratio TR is one for most process industries. So assuming a value of one for, for our areas, it's a simple matter to say, well, the estimated capital cost for a new process is roughly equal to the sales that are made from the products produced at that site. Now you can have you can clearly see how this is a very, very crude estimate. Right? Because the site may make a certain number of sales this year, and five years ago they made a different number of sales. But you're going to get two different fixed capital cost estimates, but it's for the same site. So clearly, this, there's, a, there's a, some sort of time time function in here, and at most, it's an extremely broad estimate. So as much as 50% underestimated and 100%, uh, sorry, between 50 minus 50 and 100%. So if you estimate a value, you can halve it to get a lower bound, and you should double it to get an upper bound on that on that price estimate. Extremely crude and um, probably not too useful really for anything, I, uh, to be honest, if I look, if I look at the, that broad range. What we're going to look at now in today's class is um, a far more sophisticated method to get estimates of capital items. Okay, and it's called the bare module method. It is um, the, the, the approach that's used in most of the canon literature for estimating prices of, of pieces of, of, of different units. And then we'll see how we combine these modules up and form the, the entire process quotient. So this, this approach we're taking now is, is a modular-based approach. So we'll be looking at estimating the price of the heat exchanger plus all the ancillary equipment. Then downstream from the heat exchanger might be might be a reactor. We'll estimate the price of that reactor separately from the heat exchanger. Then we may have a fire heater. We'll estimate that price separately. We keep going and add up all the major units on our flow sheet to get an estimate of the total capital cost. So a lot more work is involved in, in this method. And the approach is, is as follows. All, this, all these methods rely on some historical number for, for common pieces of, of, of equipment, so reactors, heat exchanges, and so on, which are set at a particular point in time. So we get a, a, a very old, often very old, from the 1970s in most cases, is, is, is the database for these units. We, we establish the price of those units in the 1970s, for example, for a given unit made from a certain type of material, usually that's carbon steel, and at nominal pressure and nominal temperature, usually room and ambient conditions. Room temperature and, and, and very low pressure to the main What we'll first do is we'll correct for this capacity and for the fact that we may be constructing this unit from different materials. We'll correct for the fact that we'll be operating our unit at a different temperature and pressure, and we'll also inflate for the cost of time. So all of those factors get taken into account. We'll take our base case and increase it for capacity, for materials, temperatures, and pressures, and inflation. Generally, we're increasing. Um, the only time you would decrease is obviously if your historical cost is for a larger unit and we need a smaller one, so then the cost does go down. But for the most part, you'll see these databases that are for very small units and we're scaling them up to the, our requirements in 
for our size. Then we add in what's called free on board. I'll explain that, that term now in a minute. Labor, materials for installation and, and shipping. And then we'll get a, a FOV cost. And oh, that's what's then we'll, um, we'll, up, we'll update that FOB cost and get a bare module cost, which includes the fees for contractors and, and contingencies, and then we'll get the total module cost. So let me just uh, let me just talk around this diagram to illustrate the principle of what a bare module cost is. So FOB cost for a heat exchanger, free on board cost for the heat exchanger on the pallet and secure. That's standard method, method of delivering equipment. So, for example, when I was working in Glaxo, we ordered a piece of equipment from Japan, and the quote we get was for X dollars, FOB, our docks in Osaka. So this company in Osaka, they will put that piece of equipment on their loading dock, and that's the end of their, their quotation. That price is for them to make the equipment and put it on their loading dock. That's the quote. FOB, so free on board is the quote you get for where that unit is going to be. It may be at the company's loading dock. The company may say FOB Vancouver docks at a certain ship. So they will deliver that unit to a particular dock on a ship in a loading yard somewhere in Vancouver. So that's the price that you're going to pay to get the unit to that point. So FOB is the destination point from where your responsibility starts. Okay, so FOB is usually qualified where it is. FOB, some, some companies loading dock, some shipping point. Um, that's, that's the standard way. Sometimes companies will quote you uh, for delivered. So they'll give you the cost delivered to your site. But that's not too common. The reason for that is because there's some liability between transporting it from their site to your site. And they're not usually happy to take that on. So most companies will quote for the minimal shipping. They'll quote FOB my loading docks at my site. Then it's up to you to arrange insurance and shipping from their site onwards to your location. And then you get your this heat exchanger on the pallet at your loading docks. You move this heat exchanger and you move to install it at the particular location where you usually need it. So FOB cost, that's really literally just the purchasing cost on your side. Now you incur costs to unpack and create this unit, to, you, you've incurred costs of shipping it, um, and transportation and insurance for that. Then you've had to pay labor to move it off the crate at your loading dock to the final position, which you first had to construct some cement blocks, some foundation, you've had some site, uh, site preparation over there. So all the engineering regarding the leveling of that site, um, testing the soil for uh, stability, and that it can handle the required load that you're placing on it. The concrete, the structural steel around it to support this unit and your structural support. And then all the labor and expense to get that installed. That's just the heat exchanger on the, on the blocks. But then you have piping that you have to then attach to this unit piping of a compatible type and material with the heat exchanger. Uh, so to prevent corrosion, you would make sure that you correct, use the correct piping joints, uh, the correct fittings. Once piping is installed, the racking around it to support the piping, then you often have painting. So this is not just regular paint. This is special paint to withstand the external environment that it's operating in, any of the chemicals that are exposed to that environment. Um, and in many cases, there's also insulation, especially if there's a high temperature pipe you want to in insulate. It. That insulation cost is substantial as well. So pretty much all the materials and construction and work that's required around a three meter radius of the unit is considered the bare module. So if you draw this imaginary box, this module boundary, all the work required to install that, that unit, all those, uh, those items that I've just mentioned over there, that's the bare module cost. Okay? We're, that's what we're estimating here. 
that module cost includes, as I've mentioned there, that I'm creating the inspection of the units, the structural foundation, um, cement blocks and supports for the, for the unit, piping instrumentation, painting and insulation, which is covered. You will need uh, utility hookups to that, and then engineering supervision to, to manage the, uh, all, that, all, that con all those contractors, the electrical contractors, the piping contractors, welding, uh, and then all the safety issues just that take place during during installation. So uh, very often you, you have to sequence your order of, of installation to prevent safety issues from occurring. For example, welding needs to take place before you start having any volatile organic compounds in the area. Um, so taking care of that isolation and those safety issues during installation adds additional cost and additional people to manage that, that process. So those, those can be pretty substantial. Um, and so what we're after with this method is, can we take our purchase price of our heat exchanger, and is there a way to come up with some number that says, given the price of the heat exchanger, I would like to just multiply it by some value and get an estimate of, of that total bare module cost. And that's the easiest way we, we would like to work. Rather than going to say, well, for a heat exchanger, we need this amount of piping, this amount of painting, insulation and individual items, rather than go through every single one of these costs, can we just lump them all together and based on experience with heat exchanges over a variety of companies, um, can we just come up with some multiplier? So that's that's exactly where we're, where we're going with this. Okay, so this very busy slide is something we're going to walk through in a minute. Um, I'll come back to it, but uh, I'll just quickly <coughs> jump ahead to this slide and show you how it works. So we're going to take a database cost for a known design at a particular point in time for, for a very specific configuration. Then we're going to multiply it by a capacity factor. So if this original design for a heat exchanger, for example, was for um, 100 meters squared, but our needs are for 400 meters squared, we're going to multiply up this base case of 100 meters squared by an appropriate factor for our needs, which are 400 meters squared. Then we're going to correct for the time value of money, inflation. Then we're going to add in these installation costs and then these other costs for, um, that affect the fact that this original base model was made for ambient uh, temperature conditions and for one one uh, atmosphere of pressure. If our unit is operating at higher temperatures and higher pressures, that adds additional cost. So all of these nodes are multiplicative factors. They they're, they're add, they augment each other. So all of them are just multiplied by each other and we can play the price to get an estimate in today's money for our heat exchanger at the required operating conditions that we needed. So so this is where we're where we're headed with this with this uh, their module method. Okay, so um, so let's just go back then to this slide. And I hope it's clear enough in your notes. Is it is it readable? Is it legible? Pretty much on the small side. Because what I can do is uh, certain of these slides I'm quite happy to PDF and, and put a, a single large page on the course website. Just email me if that's something you want done. Um, Particularly for one of the other slides coming further on, it's pretty, pretty small. Okay, so so here's here's what we're going to do. We've got our FOB price. This is the quotation from our supplier. Uh, our supplier is saying you can pick up this equipment from my loading docks at, at my location, um, and that's the quote. That's the price you're going to pay for it. Then we're going to add in shipping, uncrating, inspection, and look up that's the installed cost. Then there's labor and materials cost. This is an additional factor. What we would like to do is to estimate our labor and materials cost by simply taking our FOB and multiplying it by the LMM factor. So take some multiple, say a number that's say two or three or five or whatever that LMM is, and it will be different LMM values for different pieces of equipment. Take the LMM factor that's appropriate for a heat exchanger or a reactor and simply multiply it by the FOB price to get an estimate of the labor and material costs we're going to incur on our side. If you need to prepare a budget for labor and materials, this is a helpful number to have. The only thing to note here is that the LM estimate 
includes everything except shipping. So shipping is never added in to that, that multiplier. And the reason is because the shipping um, doesn't correlate with the, price, with the, the units. Um, shipping is relatively independent of the unit and is almost always expensed uh, uh, by the company in, in, a, in a global shipping account. I know in my previous company, that whenever we need to ship something, it was just picked up by the corporate head office. So shipping was always paid for by the different global group they had their own supply chain uh, to handle shipping and they picked up the cost. So shipping didn't actually, we, we never added shipping into our cost estimate. So that, that's quite, quite reasonable then to get an LMM estimate is simply multiplies FOB by a factor and that includes all the labor and materials we require. Shipping then gets taken into account by saying the physical plant cost is LMM plus shipping. Then we want the bare module cost. So the bare module cost is, is all of the above. So all the piping, electrical installation, insulation, and so on. Plus our engineering fees internally. So our internal management fees from an engineering perspective, as well as the expense on the field. Um, so if we're uh, running this at if it's running at our site or at a, at a, at a remote location, uh, there's a different estimate there. But all these costs of, ins of getting it installed either at our site or at our site that remote from us um, will, will add in and we get a total bare module cost. So here's the key equation that we're looking for. Bare module cost is equal to FOB times the bare module cost. So the bare module dollars that we're going to pay is the FOB dollars we're going to pay multiplied by the bare module factor. Now, it's clear that if we look at our labor and materials up here, uh, we have to compare them. Here's the labor and materials dollars, the budget that we have to have for labor and materials is a multiplier of FOB times the LNM factor. The LNM factor is always going to be smaller than the bare module factor, just because the bare module factor includes everything that labor and materials has, plus the extra engineering fees for installing and operating this unit at our site. Now, that's not quite the total price that we're going to have to pay as the company. Uh, there's some additional costs that we're going to incur. So we add in here our contractor's fee and our contingency. So contractor's fees are usually between 3 to 5% of the bare module price. So this dollar figure we estimated over here, add an additional 3% to 5% to that, or we calculate 3 to 5% of that, that fraction of the bare module price is what we should expect to pay our contractors. And any contingencies for unanticipated changes in scope and, um, and any of the contingencies that normally come up with setting these, these big projects, strikes, <coughs> delays, uh, labor issues, um, typically get counted at 10 to 15% of the bare module price. So um, in my former company, we were not allowed to use 15%. Uh, our, our, we were very much required to have such good estimates that at most our contingency was 10%, and it was extremely frowned upon if you, if you moved into your contingency budget. They did not like for you to actually use your contingency, uh, except if you really need it. So generally, you should have fairly good estimates to try and avoid contingency, but so, some companies will be a bit more relaxed about it and have 15%. Other companies are quite, quite strict that you should be able to operate and manage your project to remain within budget. And very often you're rewarded for doing that. So if you're able to, to remain within the budget, uh, it's, uh, it's quite hard. Which kind of means that all the engineers tend to just inflate the original estimates up a little bit so that they never had to go into the engineers. But that's more of a political issue. OK, so we've got, let's just recap here. We've got our FOB cost that we get on the quotation from the vendor, our labor and material cost, our bare module cost. We add in. Once we have our bare module cost, the contractors fees and contingencies, we get our total fixed capital investment. Then we still have additional costs that we have to incur. 
we have to buy the land, there may be legal expenses, and, uh, there's all sorts of accountants and other labor and overheads from that, and this really is a bit harder to estimate. Um, so it's, it's a very crude, a crude um, estimate here. You would have a better sense of this if you actually were working in a company. So we don't really try to focus on this too much in this course, because it, is, it can be quite specific to the case you're dealing with. And then you get your total investment cost. Um, this is your total capital expense that you then report in your cash flows that we've been doing up to now. Okay, so let's just take an example um, of, of that. Here, um, well let's, before I get to that example, I just talk about the capacity factor. We've seen this uh, in, the, in the last class and in the tutorial. The capacity factor simply says if we have a known design for a known piece of equipment B, and we're trying to estimate the cost A of some new design or new equipment, we can ratio the factors between our desired unit D and the known units, uh, sorry, the known uh, unit D and the desired unit that we're, we're working with, which is A. So we ratio that and then we, we, we raise it to a power N. The key point on this slide is what is that factor? And as, as, as written here, the factor is a feature of the design or of the unit that best correlates with capital cost. So, for example, with heat exchangers, the feature of the heat exchanger that most correlates with the capital cost is temperature difference, number of tubes, circumference, length, material construction, which, which parameter on the heat exchanger would you expect most be most related to the cost? Surface area. Surface area. So the, the ratio of the, of the areas of the old heat exchanger or the known heat exchanger versus the designed heat exchanger would be the factor that you use. Um, for a distillation column, number of trays, or so there's the you're on the right track. The, there's only one issue there with trays is it's it's always dependent on the spacing of the trays. So if I had 15 trays in, and in one column, 15 trays in the other. Then but there can be space, height, height and diameter are the two, two factors. So volume of the distillation column. Um, what about a pump? Horsepower. Um, so those are, those are, that's the type of thinking you need to have, is to select the appropriate factor for, for, for this ratio. The textbooks, when they give you, um, the textbook will list what this value of N is for different units. So the, the value for a heat exchanger, for example, is 0.69, would be the correct exponent to use. For different units, you have different values of N. So the tables in, in textbooks will list what factor you should be using, so surface area, diameter, length, volume, etc. They'll list the exponent for you, and then they'll give a description of the unit itself. Um, but if you have no knowledge, or the unit that you're looking to size is not in the textbook, two things. The factor then is the harder part to select. You have to select an appropriate factor that, that does correlate with the capital cost. And the value for n you would use then is 0 0.6. So with the, in the absence of any knowledge, 0 0.6 would be uh, a, a good default value. But the textbooks are quite specific on what value of n to use. So what I'll do here, um, rather than this example, is I'll just uh, have, have a different example that you can quickly look at here. And if we looked at a compressor, for example, a compressor of um, <laughs> 200 BQ per minute of, of, of the air flowing through there. This is a two stage. Um, 
1985 is the cost of that was 160,000. a limitation on this. Whenever you look at these textbooks, I said that they will tell you the exponent F. They will tell you the unit that you're considering, so compressors, pumps, heat exchangers, and so forth. But they will also give you, very importantly, the range over which that correlation is valid. So this is critical here. This other issue that you must look up in is not only N, that exponent, but also consider the range of the correlation. Okay, so you must ensure that, uh, that your required unit is within the range of that correlation. The next thing to consider is the fact that this was in 1985. And if we make an estimate in today's price, we need to inflate that. By which inflation rate should we could we use? Would it be appropriate to use the average inflation since 1985 to 2012 for, for the general the general market? Probably not, because the 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 way the, the, the consumer price indexes or inflation prices are, they're uh, factored based on a bundle of goods that one purchases day to day as a person. They're not appropriate for construction and engineering projects. Um, so we have alternative sources of inflation information that are specific to the process industries. Um, the first one is the Marshall and Swift Index, uh, which was 301 in 1970, and then has moved up now to over two times that in, in, in 2000. So the ratio of 3.6 from 1970 to 2000 indicates that any good or any, um, any piece of unit bought back in, in 1970 has more than tripled in price to 2000. So this is a multiplicative factor then that we multiply the cost estimate with. So we take, um, so if I needed to ask for well, this price back in 2000, let's say, we were going from 1985 to 2000, I would then multiply by, we'll, we'll pick this up in the next class, but I'll multiply by the index, in 2000, divided by the index in 1985. Or well, whichever the year is, if I would like to estimate in 2012, I would have to look for the index in 2012 and then divide it through by the index in 1985. So this table here is very good. It jumps in years of 10. Uh, there's more specific information that I'll post on the course website for year by year. And the next class, what I'll do is I'll only talk about the different indexes. Why do we have four different indexes and, and what, what do they mean? But this is your inflation factor. So we'll pick it up in the next class. 